<laughs> okay. Oops. So it's now recording. So welcome to GRE Prep. This is provided by um, Psychology Institute. Um, we have a whole bunch of different presentations throughout the year, um, and now I'll just start kind of recording um, them and putting them in Blackboard, which allows people to access them many semesters later. So today, I will admit, it's going to be kind of boring. I don't know how to make the GRE very interesting. Um, it's a very boring, <laughs> it's a very boring test. Um, I also would um, say to keep an eye out on who you're applying to, because now more and more schools are getting rid of the GRE um, for graduate school, especially this year um, because of COVID. Um, so I know that's something that's happening. Um, so I think we'll see it kind of be phased out slowly, but that does not necessarily mean that every school is phasing it out. Um, but basically what the GRE is, is it's like the SAT or the ACT that you took to get into college, into undergrad, but this is a test that um, allows you to get into graduate school. Um, so the scores range from 130 to 170 um, in verbal reasoning and quantitative reasoning, and then the analytical writing portion of the GRE is from, uh, graded from one through six. Um, and it's really important to look at where you're applying um, because those requirements change. Um, so for example, I just have this, <laughs> this table here to show you. Um, typically all the scores are uh, relatively the same, but as you can see for social and behavioral sciences, we don't require as high of a quantitative reasoning uh, score. But again, I would look at the specific school that you're applying to because that will tell you what their minimum GRE uh, requirements are. So if you do not hit their minimum GRE, don't even apply to that school because they use GPA and GRE as a way to screen people out so that they don't have to spend their time looking at applications because uh, they'll get a whole bunch of applications. So this is their way of throwing out applications. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of it that I wanted to say. So all throughout this presentation, I'm just going to go through each over through blah, 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 over each of the sections. And then um, at the end, I'll talk about the tips and like a little advice that I've kind of picked up along the way. Um, so the overview of the verbal reasoning section. Um, so this section tests your ability to analyze and evaluate written material, um, your ability to synthesize information obtained from the written material, um, analyze relationships among components of a, like parts of the sentence, uh, recognize relationships among words and concepts. And we'll go over examples to show you because I know this kind of sounds really abstract. Um, but half of the test requires you to read and then answer questions about those passages. Um, while uh, the other half requires you to kind of read and interpret and complete existing sentences. So one section you'll just read um, a paragraph and it'll have different questions about about the reading. So like, oh, you know, what was the main point or, you know, uh, what did this author's opinion on this? What was that? Um, versus the other part is more about like fill in the blanks. So you try to fill in like the vocab word that fits um, best. So like I said, there's three types of questions, reading comprehension, text completion, and sentence equivalency. Um, so reading comprehension is just reading the passage and then um, it asks you questions about it. So will be maybe asked to summarize what you just read. Um, maybe they'll ask you what the author's assumptions or their opinions or their perspective is. Um, maybe you'll have to identify different strengths and weaknesses of a certain position. Um, you draw conclusions from the information provided. So they'll ask you like based on what you read, do you um, believe that the author, you know, thinks that this is a good idea or something? And then you have to like fill in whatever answer is the most correct. <laughs> uh, distinguish between minor and major points, um, understanding the meaning of a paragraphs and larger bodies of text. Um, 
So for the reading comprehension, you'll have 10 passages. Most of them are just a paragraph in length, and then you'll have one to six questions per passage. Um, if it is getting harder, that's a good sign because that means that you keep answering questions correctly and they keep um, giving you um, harder passages. Um, so there are some uh, that so this is what I like. These are the questions I like where it's a multiple choice question and there's only one standard answer, but there's also questions that have um, one question and then there's multiple right answers and you have to select all the right answers. Um, yeah. Um, I also would, here's my advice. So you're going to read a bunch of different topics. So it's not gonna be all psych related. You'll learn like, like how I said, biological science, arts, humanities, physical sciences, all these different topics. And it's going to become kind of unfamiliar and don't get bogged down in the aspect of like, I don't know this, like this isn't like what I, like I don't know anything about the, like technology or the environment or, you know, the planets or whatever it is. Um, everything that you need to know is in the passage. Um, so don't try to get too overwhelmed about it. Um, if you want more practice on how to kind of read information that you're not familiar with, it might be a good idea to look at journal articles, um, for example, that aren't in the field of psychology, uh, just to kind of get yourself familiar of what it feels like to read something that you're not totally all knowing about. Uh, I recommend that you read the questions first so you know what to look for so you're not wasting your time um, reading and then seeing the questions and then going back to read it again. Um, and then make sure that you read the answers all throughout instead of just like looking at the first part because they'll try to trick you. <laughs> like they'll have the first part of the answer correct and then the last part won't be correct. So this is an example of what a reading comprehension uh, question would look like. So reviving the practice of using elements of popular music in classical composition, an approach that has been in hibernation in the United States during the 1960s. Uh, composer Philip Glass, born in 1937, embraced the ethos of popular music in his compositions. Glass-based two symphonies, symphonies, sorry, on music by rock musicians David Bowie and Brian Eno. Um, but the symphonies, symphonies, I don't know why I can't say that word. Sound is distinctly his. Um, popular elements do not appear out of place in Glass's classical music, which from its early days has been shared certain harmonies and rhythms with, within the rock music. Um, yet this, the use of popular elements has not been made, uh, has not made Glass a composer of popular music. His music is not a version of popular music packaged to attract classical listeners. It's a high art for listeners steeped in rock rather than the classics. Whew, I definitely butchered that. So anyways, and then this is an example of where only one um, answer is correct. It will tell you select only one answer choice. Um, so the passage addresses which of the following issues related to Glass's issue of the popular elements in his classical com compositions. So A, how it is regarded by listeners who prefer rock to classics. Um, how it has affected the commercial success of Glass's music, um, whether it's contributed to a rival of interest among other composers in using popular elements in their composi compositions, whether it has had detrimental effects on Glass's reputation as a composer of classical music, and whether it caused a certain uh, of Glass's work to be derivative in quality. Ooh, okay. So for the sake of time, I'll just give the answer. <laughs> so it's E. Um, so one of the important parts of the passage that makes it when classes uses popular elements in his music, the result is very much of his own. It's distinctively his. In other words, the music is far from being derivative. Um, that's one issue that the passage addresses is that one referred uh, to one and answer choice E. Um, it's weird because it answers in the negative and that's why it throws people off. Um, but it doesn't discuss any of the other like A through D. Um, so just kind of give you an example of like 
the challengingness or the difficulty level of reading comprehension, um, as well as that's like a lot of answers to have to read through and understand what the answers are, what the passage is, um, and then decipher it all. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, and I think I was just trying to show that it's important to, I think, look at the questions first um, and then read it um, just so you know, OK, I'm going to be looking out for, oh my gosh, I'm going to be looking out for each of these answers. So I got to look out, oh, is he talking about the listeners who prefer rock to classics? Is it this and this? Um, just to spend your time more wisely. Um, oh my gosh. Come on. Okay. So, um, now I'll go on to text completion questions. Um, these just require the reader to find out what the crucial word belongs in the blank. Um, so it might contain like, I don't know, one to five sentences and there might be one to three blanks. And then there's three choices per blank. Um, if there's multiple blanks and then five choices if it's just a single blank. So for my advice is to read the passage just to get an understanding of what it's talking about. Um, then try to fill in the words yourself as you're reading through. Um, and then when you look at the answers, try to see if there's anything similar to what you had thought it was. Um, and you can fill out whatever is the easiest for you, so you don't have to start at the first blank. If you know what the second blank is, put that in and then kind of move around to whatever's easiest. Um, and then just make sure that it's logical, it makes grammatical sense. <laughs> grammatical, gramma grammarly, it's correct. Um, and all of that fun stuff. Also, important to note, if there's a multiple blank uh, question, if you get one of the blanks wrong, but everything else right, the whole question is wrong. Which is kind of annoying. So this is an example of a text completion example. Um, ugh, so I'm just going to read it out loud. It is refreshing to read a book about our planet by an author who does not allow facts to be blank by politics. Well aware of the political disputes about the effects of human activities on climate and biodiversity, this author does not permit them to blank. His comprehensive description of what we know about our biosphere. He emphasizes the enormous gaps in our knowledge, the sparseness of our observations, and the blank, calling attention to the many aspects of our planetary evolution that must be better off understood before we can accurately diagnose the condition of our planet. <coughs> so have a choice of all these different um, answers, I guess. And so as you can see for blank I, there's these three options. Um, and then for blank two, the following options and then blank, blank three, the corresponding answers. And so for me, I would have probably started off. I feel like I would have actually started off with the first one. It makes sense to me. Um, and then kind of slowly work down. So I'll show you kind of the way that to like approach it, I guess. So the passage is complimentary. So we need to understand what the author is like complimenting this person on. Um, and so they recommend that you start in the second blank. Um, and so here we must determine what a word would indicate, um, something that the author is praised for not permitting. The only answer choice that fits this case is obscure since enhancing and underscoring are generally good things to do, um, not one things that people should refrain from doing. Uh, choosing obscure clarifies the choice for the first blank, um, and the only choice that fits well with obscure is overshadowed. Uh, overshadowed. Um, notice that trying to fill the first blank before filling the second blank is hard. Um, I didn't think so, but maybe that's because I came in biased, um, and that could also influence um, the way that you read a passage. So if you already have an idea of kind of what the passage is about or what your so for example, when I say I'm biased, let's just say that there was a climate change like passage and I believe in climate change, right? If I'm reading that way, I might be more um, 
apt to pick words that go along with uh, what I believe. And then sometimes they do that to try to trick you up so that you're closely actually paying attention to what you're reading. Um, but anyways, so I'll keep going. Um, it's just more to get you an idea of what these questions look like um, rather than kind of really breaking things down because I feel like there are better sites and it's better to just kind of do it on your own time. Um, but again, the GRE is such a huge test. It has a whole bunch of different uh, ways of asking questions and so I just wanted to kind of get people aware of what they ask. Um, so another part is sentence equivalency. Um, this tests the ability to reach a conclusion about how a passage should be completed. Um, they can have a single sentence, a one blank, and six answer choices. Um, it does require you to select two of the answers, which I hate. <laughs> I hate doing this. Um, so it's a very sen similar to sentence completion. You're trying to get an overview of what the passage is. Um, you try to fill in what the words you think that they um, are and what fits in the best. All right, and it also always tells you, like I said, whether you select two or one, but OK. So anyways, although it does contain some pioneering ideas, one would hardly as um, so this is where your knowledge of vocab would really come in um, to understand what these are. My way of doing it is, OK, trying to understand the essence of the paragraph and then trying to pair up words that like are alike. Because even if I find words that are alike or mean the same thing, and even if they don't fit, I know to cross them off because I know that they're not going to work um, in there. So the, oh, the word although is a crucial signpost here. Uh, the work contains some pioneering ideas, but apparently it's not overall a pioneering work. Thus, the two words that could fill the blank appropriately are original and innovative. Uh, note that orthodox and conventional are two words that are very similar in meaning, but neither one completes a sentence sensibly. Um, so that's why I like pairing them together because it's just easier for my eye anyways to cross them off and know, OK, I've eliminated two. What else can I look at? OK, on to quantitative reasoning, which is just basically math. Um, so you test your math skills. Um, it calls it elementary math concepts. <laughs> I feel like that's condescending, but um, anyways. Um, and then ability to reason quantitatively. So you have arithmetic, so um, just kind of knowing how to factor um, prime numbers, um, like the arithmetic um, exponents, absolute values, all of that you should know. Um, algebra, so knowing how to like find x <laughs> and then like doing an equation to get to x. Uh, geometry and then data analysis, which I believe most psychologists um, or psychology majors are probably pretty good at data analysis. The other ones I feel like most of, I mean, that's kind of a swooping bias, but I kind of feel like the most we would probably struggle with just because we don't really have that much in our work, but we have a lot of data analysis um, like in classes, like for SPSS and everything. Um, I will post the slides obviously in Blackboard for Psych Institute um, so that you can just click on the slides and get these links. Um, I also have at the end more resources on how to understand math concepts. Um, but basically the types of questions that we'll see is a quantitative comparison, multiple choice, um, and numeric entry question. So quantitative is just saying which one is larger or this one B is larger or A is larger or there's neither of them is larger or you can't tell. I guess I could just show the question, but OK, anyways. Um, so these questions ask you to compare two quantities and then uh, determine which of the following describes the comparison. I would make sure that you memorize these answers because they always stay the same. Um, so it shouldn't be the first time that you see it when you actually take the test. Um, avoid unnecessary computations. So you just estimate the best that you can because um, you don't have a lot of time because it's timed. <laughs> Um, know that the geometric figures are not drawn to scale. Uh, plug in numbers um, if both of them um, allow it, kind of. 
So for this one, this is an example of a quantitative comparison question. Lionel is younger than Maria. Quantity A, twice Lionel's age. Um, Maria's age is quantity B. And then you have these options that you have to check from. So what I would do is just plug in numbers and be like, okay, I'm going to pretend Leon, Lionel or whatever his name is, is one. And actually I'm going to say, yeah, Lionel is one and Maria is two. And so twice Lionel's age would be two. Okay, well that makes them equal. Okay, so then I'm going to pretend that Lionel is 10 and Maria is this. And you just kind of go through is how I would approach it. Um, and so the correct answer is D. The relationship cannot be determined from the information given, and it kind of walks you through on why that is. Here um, is an example of a multiple choice option. So if 5x plus 32 equals 4 minus 2x, what is the value of the x? It gives you a list of options. Um, this one I had to do by myself. <laughs> But basically you get um, all the X's to one side and on all the non X's to the other side. Um, so for me, I would add two X to the other side because it's just easy for me. Um, and then I would minus 32 from that side. And so you get seven X equals negative 28. Um, and then you try to get X completely by itself. So you divide it by seven. And then whatever you have to do to one side, you have to do the other side. Four. I am weirdly good at algebra, but nothing else. <laughs> um, and then the last section is analytical writing. Um, basically, you have two writing prompts and one you analyze an issue and you take a stand on whatever the issue is. Um, and then the other one is analyzing an argument and determining if it if it's a good argument or not. Um, oh, there's um, these websites um, have examples of what prompts they've used in the past to kind of give you an idea of what it feels like and what it kind of in the past. Um, so this is an analyze an issue. So as people rely more and more on technology to solve problems, the ability to, of humans to think for themselves will surely deteriorate. Um, and then discuss the extent to which you agree or disagree with the statement and explain your reasoning for the positioning you take. In developing um, and supporting your position, you should consider ways in which the statement might or might not hold true and explain how these considerations shape your position. Um, and so these are like ideas of what you would do if maybe you agreed with the topic. Um, I'm not going to go through it. And these would be if you didn't agree and this is how you're going to argue that. Um, and so you do have an option or not an option. You do have the ability or opportunity to have like a scrap piece of paper. And so what I would probably do is an outline first um, and then write the question or do the not write the question, write your answer. Um, for argument, you're arguing if the author makes a good case. Um, and so you should pay attention to what they offered as um, support or proof, um, what is kind of stated, whether it's explicitly or kind of concluded, um, what is assumed, and maybe that's where you can attack them and say, you know, you made this assumption, but that's not necessarily true, blah, 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 blah. Okay, on to general advice. So my strategy. I hated math. Math was my weakest subject throughout my entire life. And so I knew I wasn't going to do well on the math part. And so my way of approaching it was just to get math to an acceptable like level where I am just meeting the requirements um, and then trying to um, use verbal reasoning to kind of pump, pump it up um, so that it looks pretty good. Um, I have heard that you don't have to do amazing on the GRE. It's just, can you meet the minimum? <laughs> and maybe like a few points like above. However, you don't need to score this high, high, high number. Um, once you hit kind of a certain threshold, it doesn't matter how well you score. So really you need to focus, can I meet the basic minimum uh, requirements is what I would approach at first. 
um, you need to practice. So there's free apps. Um, there are like reading material, like books and things like that, um, that you can get at Norfolk State Library. Although I don't think you're allowed to take it home. Um, for whatever reason, those are usually things that you have to keep at the library. Um, you can also, like I said, try reading unfamiliar um, topics like economics or something, articles to get familiar with reading unfamiliar topics. Um, oh, and another thing is make sure that you have enough time to take it again because you can't take it again. Like if I did really bad this past weekend, I can't take it again this weekend. Um, I have to wait like 21 days and you can only take it five times per year, but I don't think you'll ever hit that five times mark because the GRE is expensive. <laughs> it takes <laughs> a lot of moolah. Um, it's about $205, at least when I took it, uh, just to do the test. You do get four free scores to send to your school. So it's important to know um, what their uh, ETS score is or the code is so you can send it. Um, but it's also good because I didn't send mine because I wasn't sure. I didn't know that you could do this and I wasn't sure what the GRE requirements were. I couldn't remember each of the schools. And so I didn't send it just in case because I was worried I didn't meet the requirements. So then I had to pay later to get them sent. Um, if you can, you can make a case to uh, the publisher, which is EST, um, saying that it's a hardship to do this um, test um, and they will produce either like a reduced cost or a scholarship to do so. Um, but you have to provide some type of proof and that will take time too. Um, make sure that you look ahead of GRE. Um, in my experience, the spots fill out really, really quickly um, because it's not like you can test a lot of people at once. Usually they only have a few spots open. Um, and it, especially the closer you get to when you have to apply, they start filling up really quickly. Um, I also didn't want to drive far away <laughs> to take my test. I was a busy undergrad. I didn't want to take all day to do this test. And so I really only wanted to sign up at my home university. Um, and my home university only offered it twice a month. So those are things that you have to keep in mind when you're trying to register for the GRE um, is, you know, where do I want to take it? What times and days can I take? Um, cause there's only certain universities that will offer it, um, at particular days. Um, just know that, like I kind of already mentioned that if the test is getting harder, that's a good sign cause that means that you're doing well. Um, it's broken up into two sections of verbal reasoning, two sections of quantitative reasoning, and two sections of two analytical writing, and they're not one after another. So you might have verbal reasoning and then quantitative reasoning and then analytical writing, writing, and then maybe you'll start off at quantitative reasoning and then verbal and then analytic. So you'll never have like verbal reasoning, verbal reasoning twice in a row consecutively. Um, another thing that I recommend is build your endurance for this test. It is a long, long, long test. Um, it is about four hours and you only get one week. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that this test is not the first time you take it. Like, make sure you take practice tests and make sure you do it in the same format that the GRE requires, which is a four hour thing, rather than like taking one section and like, oh, okay, I'm gonna take a 30 minute break. Oh, I'm gonna come back to it. Um, just to build your endurance, like I said, I didn't practice that well. <laughs> and by the end of it, I kind of had this like, I don't even care what I score. I'm done with this test. It is hour three, I'm done. Um, and I was just kind of annoyed. So I think that towards the end, I wasn't doing very well just because my body was just like, no. <laughs> um, so make sure for that 10 minutes, maybe you bring a snack um, or some water. Uh, make sure you're wearing comfortable clothing um, to not distract yourself, things like that. Um, another thing that like kind of like psyched me out right before was that they take this test so seriously. <laughs> 
it is it made me anxious and i'm a very anxious i think person in general um but it was just crazy to me so you bring your id and your confirmation email um and your id has to match exactly with the confirmation email and I like I would suggest that you arrive early because the testing center, if you're five minutes late, they can just deny you and say, nope, sorry, we can't do that. And take into account that this whole checking procedure that I'm going to talk about counts in that time. So that's why you want to show up early, especially if there's other people before you who are going through this stupid checking thing. So... <laughs> At least where I went, my university, I had to like pull up my sleeves and show them I had no answers on my wrist. And then I had to take my pockets out and like show them that there was nothing in. And then they didn't like that I had earrings in. So I had to take that out. Um, and they like, you go through this weird check thing with them. Um, and then you put everything else in these lockers. Um, they video record you. They do all these weird things. So just make sure that you come at least 30 minutes early. Um, this is why I wanted to do it also at my local university um, because I knew where to park. I knew where the building was. I knew all these different things. Um, so if you're obviously we're an NSU student. So if you're NSU, I would recommend taking the test at NSU just because you know, okay, this is what traffic's like. This is like when I go at this time, it's usually like this. If you have to go to a different university, like for example, ODU, it might be, you know, where, where can I park? And like, what's, how much does it cost to park? Um, do they accept credit cards? Like little things like that. Or like, I feel like I would get stressed out too, just because that's just kind of who I am. If I couldn't find parking right away, um, or I couldn't find the building or things like that. So onto the resources. So this kind of breaks it down and then I talk a little bit and expand a little bit more. Um, but the GRE developer, so ETS, um, will give you tips. They offer example questions. That's where I got my example questions from. Um, they have two preview like tests that you can do for free. Um, there's a Varsity Tutors GRE exam prep app that's completely free. Um, you can find a study buddy. I don't know how. I've never done it, so I don't know what the process is, but it's free. You can buy books, um, and they offer free tests and um, kind of walk you through. It does kind of get costly, though, which is why I recommend NSU's library because they have um, those resources. Um, there's classes. They tend to be very expensive. Um, and then you can take practice tests with other organizations um, or companies um, that can sometimes be free. Um, so here's an example of one of the outside per, uh, like companies that offer free tests. Um, they only offer two tests, but if you get enough of those organizations, you can get a lot of free tests. Um, things like that. Oh, I guess this is so this is the one that comes up with. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This is the one that comes from the organization that develops it. Um, but there are plenty of other organizations that have their own. Mm -mm -mm. Um, this kind of breaks down um, the different parts of the test and um, you can use it to get uh, practice on each of the questions as well as explanations for what the right answers are. Um, Magoosh is a vocab app that's free. I don't like apps like this. Here's my personal opinion. <laughs> they give you a bunch of vocab words and you try to learn them. I don't know, you could learn a whole bunch of vocab words, but the, there might be only two <laughs> that show up on your test, yet you spent all this time studying. Um, so I don't recommend pouring a lot of time into this. Um, it might be a good idea to just do it once in a while, just to kind of get an idea of what kind of questions or what kind of vocab, I should say, the GRE uses. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's my two cents on it. Um, 
this one is okay so manhattan review is a not this is not from the developer it's an outside organization um and this one offers an adaptive format so this is it's structured exactly how the GRE is, that once you get things right, the rest of the questions get harder. Um, but yeah. Uh, McGraw um, offers, um, oh, so it has like different, um, different sections and then it will have videos explaining each of the questions and like what the right answer is and how you should get to that. Uh, can is it Khan? Can Khan Academy? Um, this is a good site to look up. For example, when I had like the math um, things, if you're not familiar with what prime numbers are, you can look it up onto Khan Academy, and they'll tell you exactly um, what they are. And I feel like it's a pretty good resource. Okay, so I realize that the GRE is very boring. I don't know how to make it interesting because it's a boring test. <laughs> and there's not much I can do to flare it up. But if you do have any questions, obviously I'm the GA for Psych Institute for at least this remaining semester and next semester. Um, and so I can help you get resources with the GRE. Um, if you have questions, maybe I can answer them on a practice test. Um, things like that. Um, if you have any more questions about the GRE, I'm totally welcome to discuss them as well. But yeah, that concludes that though.